Uh, I've been doing the metadata thing for a long time, uh, as I meant, as Corinna mentioned, and now uh, having a company doing it. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk about domain repositories enriching the global research infrastructure. And for uh, my uh, definition of a global infrastructure includes things like ORCID, ROAR, Datasite, Crossref, Fundref, PubMed, identifiers.org, a lot of the large, uh, or a lot of the large and small, mostly these are large uh, organizations with collections of tens of millions of things, um, holding them together into the, uh, into the global research infrastructure. So that's what I mean uh, by that term. And um, the global infrastructure is uh, not just journal articles or data sets anymore. This is uh, the number of uh, the three big things uh, that were in data site. Uh, this was uh, last summer. So it's been a while, the numbers are bigger, but data site includes uh, nearly three, 31 million findable items with many different types. And those types are in the metadata and this is what, uh, what the possible types are. And the important thing about this uh, list is that the things that are listed in green um, were added in the most recent uh, version of the data site metadata schema, which came out uh, just about a year ago now. <clears throat> and the, the increase, you can see a, a significant increase in the number of kinds of things that data site is, uh, is supporting or is allowing you to provide metadata for. So um, this growth in the, in the kinds of things that we can describe in data site is important uh, and it reflects uh, a realization by data site and the data site metadata working group, which I'm uh, lucky to participate in, in, in the importance of a wide, you know, identifiers for a wide number uh, for, for a broad number of things and an increasing number of things. Uh, we'll be adding at least instruments to this list in the next release of the schema and, and maybe several other things. So, so the, the, the breadth of the global research infrastructure, I would say, is, is increasing. <clears throat> um, the, the infrastructure has two important roles. The first one is to identify things, giving mostly digital identify, digital object identifiers and other kinds of identifiers to these multiple kinds of things, and increasingly important making connections between those things. And uh, that's mostly what I'm gonna talk about today is, is finding identifiers for things, all kinds of things, and uh, using these, those identifiers to, to make connections between things. Um, we're also interested in FAIR and a FAIR recommendation. And a number of years ago, I did a project with Matt Jones uh, and Peter Slaughter at NCs and others. Uh, and we made a, a set of FAIR recommendations or recommendations, metadata re uh, recommendations related to FAIR. And um, those build on the data site mandatory fields. Data site has six uh, mandatory fields and then uh, a resource URL, that's the seventh. And as many, I'm sure everyone here knows, the, the FAIR recommendations are not very uh, specific when it comes to uh, metadata fields. I think the, uh, it's numerous, you know, recommend, the recommendation is that your metadata include numerous fields. And <clears throat> as part of the metadata project, we got together with uh, Matt and Peter at NCs and also representatives of Dryad, uh, CDL, LTER, and EDI, and we came up with a set of recommend re recommended fields in data site land. <clears throat> and these are divided into four different groups. Uh, things that are essential for findability, these are mostly text things that people would find with uh, various kinds of text searches, so abstracts, um, keywords, things that are words, uh, temporal and spatial extent for mapping uh, some dates. Uh, then I, 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 I tend to group together accessibility, interoperability, and reuse uh, into AIR. Um, and here uh, there are 
things that are related to access like URIs and, and importantly connections between things and more detailed uh, descriptions of things like methods, uh, et cetera. Then there's also supporting things, element, metadata elements in data site uh, and, and other dialects that support these things. And so uh, identifiers are usually in the support category because they're important, but they're uh, in, increasingly people are searching for various identifiers, but typically historically they've searched more for text. And so there are uh, things that support both findability and uh, or all four uh, elements of FAIR, either support or essential. Um, <clears throat> and together, these cover about 60 or 65 uh, of the elements of the data site schema. So this is actually many of those elements. But in some cases, like these connections, these are, these are specific kinds of uh, related identifiers that can be added to data sites. So even though it's just one, uh, one metadata element in data site, it's actually covered by many things. And I tend to call these things spirals because back in the day we did spiral development in, uh, in software. And so maybe some of you are familiar with that idea. It's basically the idea that some uh, requirements come together in groups and then you address those uh, requirements in those groups through sort of an agile process of uh, a number of different spirals. And I've always thought about the metadata uh, improvement process is something that that happens through time. So these these spirals are are collections of related uh, metadata elements, and and the idea is that you can uh, address those address those groups of elements for similar similar uh, requirements or documentation needs uh, through some 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 period of time. So I'll talk a lot, or I tend to say things like improving data site fairness. And what that means is starting out uh, all, essentially all of the records in data site have the mandatory fields. Some of these have not been mandatory since the beginning of uh, data site, uh, specifically resource type general. So there are some records that don't have those, but that's really the starting point for uh, records in data site. And these, these mandatory fields were selected really uh, for two use cases, the identification uh, use case of giving a DOI to something, and also the citation being able to fit or being able to support uh, a typical uh, citation, uh, you know, like a journal article citation to a data set. So that's, that's really what these are uh, designed for. Um, fair findable essential builds on those with things like abstracts, things like keywords, things that support uh, text searches, and also things that support um, mapping, so temporal and spatial extents, and also affiliations for authors. Uh, so adding those in, uh, I would suggest makes um, these records more uh, more fair um, and essential. Uh, the, we're talking today about identifiers and connections. So most of the connections happen in the uh, in the in the air part in, of the game. I think these connections are really important, particularly for reuse, <clears throat> because how data sets have been used in the past, who has used them, and what have they done with those. Um, is there other uh, documentation for the data sets? Those kinds of connections really, I think, contribute to uh, reusability. Um, a couple of identifiers supporting those findable elements, and then some identifiers uh, supporting um, the air elements. So this is the process of, of adding this information, adding these fields or these elements into the data site metadata. Um, either as it's, as it's first created, or I would say more typically as time goes on, particularly in the connections, uh, the connections aren't known when the data set is first published. So they get added again as a function of time. So if I say things like improving fairness, uh, this is specifically what I mean about adding uh, particular elements to, uh, to data site uh, metadata, or of course, other kinds of metadata like EML, 
used in EDI or ISO or whatever uh, other metadata dialect you're using, you can, you can uh, improve the fairness of metadata in any dialect um, using these concepts. And many of you are familiar with the, the Data One uh, metadata evaluation uh, tools. Uh, those were were developed in the same project as these were, and and the idea of an ongoing metadata improvement process is, is definitely uh, sort of behind the way that we think about these. So I want to talk about three uh, sort of cases today. The first one is dryad roars. Uh, most people, I think, in this. Uh, discussion are familiar with the Dryad data repository, a long time uh, general repository actually emerging initially from uh, environmental work and, and ecology data sets primarily as a way for people that had papers and data associated with those papers to, uh, to publish those, uh, make those data sets available in some repository. Um, in the original concept of Dryad, there was a paper and a paper had authors and authors had affiliations and maybe identifiers. And then there was a data set that sort of hung off of that paper as a, as a supplement or something like that. So the original Dryad metadata dialect had no, um, had no information about um, author affiliations. And of course, there were also no identifiers in, in those. So when California Digital Library became involved in uh, trying to uh, influence the direction of Dryad, adding these affiliations and identifiers was, was an important early project. And I was um, uh, fortunate to work on that with, uh, with Dryad. So what we did is something that's called metadata mining or maybe metadata archeology. span the idea of, of searching through some large amount of, of material to find those gems uh, and, or other, other uh, valuable items that, that we're interested in adding into metadata. So Dryad looks like this. Most of us think about Dryad as a data repository, some number of data sets. Um, but in fact, the, as I mentioned, the history of Dryad is really a history of data sets that are connected to articles. And those articles are, are referenced from the Dryad uh, metadata and always have been. So I sort of think of them together uh, as, a, as a more, as a larger uh, kind of documentation uh, repository with data sets and articles that are related to them. Um, and Dryad is also a good example of a repository that uses uh, the global infrastructure um, relies on that global infrastructure and, and uses it effectively, both by uh, pointing to DOIs that, are, that refer to or identify papers in Crossref, and also using data site, uh, actually using the data site metadata dialect as their primary dialect and sharing all of their uh, metadata with, with data site. So I mentioned in when we started this project, there were no um, I didn't know affiliations in Dryad. So the first thing we did is we took those DOIs that existed in Dryad for the papers related to the data sets and um, used Crossref metadata to find uh, authors. And more importantly, we knew the authors in general, but we found the affiliations for those authors um, from Crossref. We brought those affiliations back in and um, uh, inserted them into the Dryad uh, metadata. We then uh, found the ROARs uh, for those affiliations. And uh, affiliation strings, as many of you are aware, are generally pretty messy uh, strings. Um, they're not just the University of Colorado at Boulder. They could be... Uh, all kinds of information about addresses and uh, different names for uh, universities or organizations. So finding the roars from a set of affiliation strings is, is, um, is a little bit like finding funders in funder strings. Uh, it's, it's a little messy, it took, but we were able to um, find tens of thousands of uh, or identifiers for uh, tens of thousands of 
uh, affiliations in um, in Dryad, and we added those in, and then those affiliations went to data site. So this is the idea of that I'm trying to think about or talk about in this talk of taking uh, an institutional repository, or in this case, uh, a general repository like Dryad that has uh, good metadata, and obviously EDI is a great example of those, and using that metadata to uh, enrich the global uh, infrastructure and get get that get the metadata, the identifiers, and the connections out there into the global uh, stream where we can start to take advantage of them. Um, sometimes I also use a term called identifier spreading, and spreading is is finding identifiers. In this case, we found some uh, in, in Crossref, but you can also find them in in data site repositories, finding those and then adding them to things they identify. So uh, one of the interesting things that I'll talk about in a minute is taking a domain repository that has a community built up around it. And those community members and the organizations that they're affiliated with generally make a number of different contributions uh, to those uh, repositories either data sets or papers that are based on, on data sets in the repositories. So if you can do the, the kind of metadata mining that we're talking about here and find identifiers for those people or those organizations once uh, anywhere in the, in the combined data set of, of data and articles, then you can spread that identifier uh, through other data sets um, that those people and organizations have uh, contributed to. So that's one of the uh, one of the ways to increase the uh, identifiers out there. <clears throat> so uh, Dryad was one of the early organizations in data site that um, added identifiers for organizations into their metadata. This shows the, the top 10 of those uh, uh, organizations and these numbers came again from last summer, but they generally don't change very fast, but they've all increased since this time. And um, so these are the 10 uh, repositories in data site that are that are leading the adoption of identifiers. And one of the interesting things is that the, the number of identifiers that are in these organizations has an interesting, at least for me, uh, an interesting pattern. And so this pie chart that's that's associated with the bar here shows um, the distribution of the number of affiliations in these repositories. In this one for um, ITK GBIS, uh, there's 208,000 um, uh, repositories, uh, sorry, identifiers used in this uh, repository, and they're, but they're all the same. There's there's only one, and um, this shows similar pie charts for these other organizations, and you, and you can see that in most of these situations, uh, the repositories identifying themselves or the, or the, reposit the organization that they, that they are associated with in their metadata records, and most of these cases only have one uh, or a small number of identifiers uh, in their metadata. Dryad is, a, is an interesting uh, exception to this rule. As I mentioned, we found uh, identifiers for thousands of different uh, organizations inside of Dryad or that had contributed data sets to Dryad. And so Dryad is really uh, different than these others. Um, it's got many different colors and many different identifiers. This is actually only showing the number of occurrences of the top 10 identifiers. So, so it only has 10, but in fact, there actually are thousands. Um, again, the first step towards identifying these organizations is, is knowing uh, the affiliations in data site metadata. And we still have a situation where only a small percentage or you know, roughly a quarter of the data site numbers currently include affiliations. So in, that, in those cases, um, the first step is always finding affiliations. And um, just to reiterate on, on this, this difference across the, uh, across the, the spectrum, of, of kinds of repositories that exist in, in data site. Um, many institutional repositories have a small or organizational repositories uh, 
uh, have a small number of organizations and therefore you only actually need to know a small number of identifiers to populate uh, the metadata records from those organizations. And then some general repositories like Dryad, same thing is true in cases like Sonodo, um, other big uh, general repositories, there's a large number of organizations in them. And um, so it's more challenging to try and find those than we were able to do that uh, in, in Dryad and, and more, uh, more general repositories are now, you know, um, building the the ability to input identifiers either into their their metadata um, submission process. So so more situations like the Dryad situation, I think, are emerging. Um, the idea of this talk, as I mentioned earlier, is that we should be enriching the um, the global infrastructure. Um, and, and I think one of the reasonable questions is like, why, like, who cares? Um, and so, <clears throat> um, I wanted to mention the data site commons, uh, the data site commons is an API that was developed recently by, um, mostly primarily by data site, but also other members of the, of the global infrastructure and the data site commons searches data site and uh, ORCID and ROAR and Crossref for identifiers, but it also searches an interesting data set called the event data. And events in event data are mentions of identifiers anywhere in, in hopefully, or sort of uh, in the World Wide Web. So if someone, uh, uh, any other social media. So if someone tweets about, uh, has a tweet that includes a DOI or has a paper that references a data set um, or discusses a data set in some, in some other social media, those are all events. And um, event data is trying to record. So it's those mentions. So event data is really about mentions of things and about connections between things. And those connections between things, I think, are one of the big advantages of the global infrastructure. So this is a page, um, uh, a data site commons page with a search for the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, shows uh, the roar for the university and also other identifiers uh, for the university. And if you, um, Click on, I think the University of Colorado, it shows the, the, the things that are identified in this. This is an example of one of those. Um, this is an example of a, sim, a, sim, a similar uh, data site commons page from the University of Minnesota. I live in Boulder, I grew up in Minnesota. These are two repositories that I'm interested in. But the interesting thing about these two uh, examples is they were published in Dryad. Um, and it turns out that if you go to Data Site Commons and you search for an organization like a university, what you find is that many of the, many of the data sets uh, that show up in those searches uh, are actually published in Dryad. And the reason that they show up is because we added into Dryad the identifiers for these organizations, for these universities, uh, as I mentioned. And so Dryad um, actually added connections uh, into the global uh, research infrastructure for thousands of, of researchers and organizations. And I wanted to just emphasize this because I think this is, this is sort of what I consider to be um, or have called sort of the activist repositories. That repositories, I think, have an important role um, in, 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 in making and in helping make these connections between things. And this is particularly true, true for domain repositories, um, like I'll talk about next, uh, UNAVCO, or things like EDI. And EDI has always had a great um, relationship with, with the various sites the various uh, LTER sites that provide data. And it's a, a very symbiotic uh, uh, supportive relationship within that community. So I think that in my opinion, um, EDI has a chance to, to, to play this role uh, of, of adding these connections into uh, and helping the community add these connections, working together with the community 
to add these connections into their uh, metadata. Uh, another thing that's really important to me is measuring things. Uh, I sort of like numbers and I like measuring. And a guy named James Harrington, who was a sort of a business uh, guru, um, you know, said that measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. Um, I'm obviously interested in the improvement part. Um, if you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't improve it. Uh, so um, whether research objects get discovered depends on their connectivity, the, the state or extent of being connected and interconnected. Uh, I think in the future, all research objects will have identifiers and connections and I, items with high connectivity will get discovered. And so the question is, how can we measure this connectivity if we'd like to help uh, measure it and improve it? So um, two ways, two uh, examples. First, ORCIDs. Um, if we have a, a DOI, a data set or a journal paper or anything that has a DOI, has two authors. Um, what I call connectivity is the number of identifiers divided by the number of people. So in this case, uh, if there are no identifiers, uh, the connectivity is zero. Uh, if there's one, uh, the connectivity is 50% which I call partial missing in the first case, partial in this case. If, uh, if things are wonderful and we have identifiers for all authors, then the connectivity is complete or 100%. Um, the same thing can be done with ROARs for organizations. These authors represent two different organizations. Uh, the number of identifiers over the number of organizations is connectivity. And just like in the last case, it can be missing uh, partial or complete. So this idea of connectivity can be applied actually to any collection of, of things that might have identifiers. It can be uh, applied to data sets in a uh, repository. It can be applied to papers that have been published in a particular journal, um, all kinds of things. And um, Uh, in, in the UNAVCO case, UNAVCO is a repository funded by National Science Foundation for uh, geodetic uh, data sets related to uh, shape of the earth. <clears throat> and I was interested in this connectivity idea there. So we were focused on uh, author identifiers and affiliation identifiers or organizations. <clears throat> and uh, similar to Dryad, we had a situation where there are a bunch of data sets that are in UNAVCO, and UNAVCO also has a list of papers that reference or that use data. In this case, uh, a little bit smaller than the UNAV than the Dryad case, something like five over five thousand data sets and over fifteen hundred papers. And um, I wanted to measure that connectivity as I just described, and also uh, display it. So if this, if this box represents uh, an entire repository, or as I mentioned, any collection of research objects, we can determine the percent of those objects that, are, that, are, that have complete connectivity, all of their identifiers, um, the percent of those objects that have some of the identifiers, and the, uh, and the percent of the objects that have no identifiers, those three categories I mentioned. And uh, this, would be, of course, will sum to 100%. And as time goes on, we can measure the change in that connectivity. And hopefully, uh, the number of the percentage of complete, uh, the percentage of objects with complete connectivity increases, uh, maybe partial decreases, and, and hopefully uh, missing also decreases. So this is the kind of, of change that we're hoping to see over time. And in the UNAVCO case for parties, so uh, I started with the, the data site metadata and 6.6% of the, of the DOIs in their data site repository had either complete or partial uh, connectivity. And through a variety of, uh, of metadata mining approaches, uh, we uh, the we were able to increase the percentage from 6.6 .6 to 56%. And this is 
without doing any searches of ORCID, uh, uh, the ORCID API. Using that, you might act, you can actually do better than this. But this is just spreading uh, spreading ORCIDs, finding ORCIDs in the papers, finding them in uh, in the data sets, and spreading them through the data site repository. Um, for ROARs, uh, there were there were uh, affiliations in the data set in the data site metadata, but no ROARs. So we started at 0% and we're able to get up to 48%, uh, 48.6. So this suggests that, that, e that using existing resources of papers and, and data sets in the, in the global research infrastructure, we can start to increase uh, significantly the number of connections, the number of identifications and connections in those repositories. <clears throat> maybe even by a factor of 10. Um, I wanted to talk about then uh, uh, ways of visualizing fairness. Uh, I like measuring things and I'm also a visual learner. So if we take all of these spirals that we've talked about so far and we can measure the percentage of completeness for each of these groups, then we can show the results um, in one figure. So this is the, the way that I've done that. And basically these are radar plots. So each of those elements that are in the metadata are around the edge of the plot. And the completeness of those is reflected uh, in the, in, in, from the center of the circle out to the end. So for instance, in this case, keywords um, have a, exist in about 50% of, of the record. So measuring from zero to the outside or zero to um, where that keyword line is, is 50%. And the, the most common thing that you see, as I mentioned in data site, is the mandatory fields, um, where those mandatory fields are in 100% of the records, uh, except resource type general that came to the party a little late. Uh, but this is a very typical thing that you see. In fact, this is an average over 190 repositories that are uh, in the TIB uh, data site consortium. TIB is the uh, technical library of Germany. It's the largest consortium uh, in data site, but, but pretty much this is a picture that you see across many, many, many uh, repositories in, um, in data site. So this is sort of mandatory fields and not much else. Um, for each of those each of those spirals, I also have numbers, percentages, so you can see those, and then a total. And so we can take those four numbers and sort of plot them in a what's called a parallel um, uh, parallel component parallel coordinate diagram, and turn the the summary of these four numbers into uh, one line, so we can sort of get a, an idea. The data site mandatory fields are all in the all except for the url are in the, the the first category findable essential so this also reflects the fact of what we see is high uh, findable essential and then uh, decreasing completeness when we go into um, the supporting categories and also the the air uh, the air categories so this is a very typical picture so um, I've been working as part of a project called RADS with a number of institutional repositories. And this shows uh, a set of those plots. And uh, the red ones are the institutional data site repositories. And so this is, these are repositories in data site where the institutional repository has submitted metadata. Um, and you can see these, the the fairness of these uh, using this measure um, are very consistent uh, and show that same pattern that I just mentioned. Uh, the green lines are other data site repositories. Uh, the most common ones are Zenodo and Dryad and Dataverse, but there's actually a uh, you know, hundred or so different uh, repositories. Um, and these repositories have metadata that's submitted by the researchers from the same institutions. So the five or six institutions are the same in both of these, and the but the the data site repositories that we're looking at uh, are different, and the way that they get their metadata is different. And obviously, uh, there's there appears to be a systematic difference between these two. 
And I was interested in why that might happen. Uh, and of course, there's a myriad of different reasons, but some of them are the, the institutional um, repositories have their own metadata collections there. Um, they work with the uh, data providers uh, or with the researchers to get metadata for those data sets. And they use, they think about uh, data site as a way to get a DOI. So they provide uh, minimal, you know, they, they provide the mandatory fields to data site, they get a DOI and they move on. And the metadata collection that they're building uh, in the institutional repository has the more detailed uh, metadata about those, um, those data sets. And as I've mentioned, this is a very typical picture that you get of repositories at DOI because the focus of, DO, of data site up until now and hopefully not into the future, but has been that identific identification and citation use cases that I mentioned earlier, and the mandatory fields sort of cover that. Um, also these, uh, I just said mandatory fields were important, and in Zenodo and Dryad and Dataverse, there are different required fields than there are in, in the mandatory uh, fields of data site, in particular, things like descriptions or abstracts are required. In some cases, keywords are required. And those are important uh, elements in the, the left hand picture here. So, so uh, if, a, if a researcher is submitting a data set to Zenodo, they include uh, the abstract in that submission. And uh, for example, uh, whereas the institutional repository doesn't because it's not required. And of course, uh, limitation we know in, in LTER and EDI, the importance of standard tools. Um, obviously, PASTA had a huge impact on, on uh, EDI and, and uh, metadata. So tools, and particularly the tools that are used for transferring metadata to um, data site come in here. Um, so because of that importance of tools and, and these three reasons, and, and you all may have obviously other, other additions, the question that, that struck me was, you know, is there existing content in these institutional repositories that we could use and, and transfer uh, in the data site in order to start, start improving um, the, uh, the, uh, the fairness of these institutional repositories in data site? You know, specifically, they already have this content, so the fairness of the institutional repositories is already higher. And can we get that? Uh, can we reflect that in in data site? We've talked about uh, doing these things as a series of iterations. And you know, in my mind, uh, I, I I thought, you know, could we do a, a first initiate a first iteration in the metadata improvement process that that takes advantage of this? After that, we can uh, start thinking about new content. And um, this new content might be identifiers. Um, it might be other things, uh, descriptions, detailed descriptions of files um, or parameters or things like that that are in maybe in readme files. And one of the important differences between these two groups is that when people make their submissions to Zenodo or Dryad uh, or Dataverse or these other general uh, or it could be domain repositories out there. They sort of, they like when they publish a paper, the metadata that goes along with those things sort of happens uh, during the submission process. And many researchers don't think about, um, or perhaps many researchers don't think about improving those things over time. In contrast, the institutional repositories or the domain repositories have have people that work there that think about data management and improving data management, bringing in new metadata, bringing in connections in particular are one of the obvious things here. But so in the, in the, in the red uh, dashed lines, the institutional repositories, we really have the uh, ability to, to improve these things as a function of time by adding new metadata. But the question I was initially interested in is, is, the, is, is there existing content that we can use to start this, this iterative process? So in the real world, uh, this is one of those uh, plots that was dashed and read on the last picture. It's an institutional data site uh, repository before the update. And you've probably guessed that um, uh, after the update, 
the, the metadata in data site for this institutional repository was increased the completeness uh, with respect to this, these fair um, uh, items was, was uh, increased um, after an update. So we actually built a tool for extracting the information from the institutional data site, uh, from the institutional repository, transferring that uh, content into data site and um, had had large significant increases in in the fairness. So I think the answer is yes. We can use existing content uh, to improve uh, the fairness uh, of the global research infrastructure, in this case, data site for these data sets. So three different stories. Uh, first, the Dryad story. Um, using DOIs that were in Dryad to find affiliations uh, for authors, finding ROARs for those affiliations and populating data site. And this is a link to a talk that uh, Danielle Lowenberg and I gave on this process. Um, and then we saw the effects of that process in searches um, uh, using data site commons, um, where, where we can see those connections show up in those, in those search results. Uh, UNAVCO, uh, a great domain repository with a strong um, uh, community built around them, finding ORCIDs and, and affiliations in data site metadata, spreading them throughout that repository, then finding ROARs, finding ORCIDs uh, and affiliations actually in journal articles and bringing those into or showing how we could bring those into uh, the data site metadata. Uh, there's a paper that um, came out recently describing that process. And then this more recent work on institutional repositories, um, finding content in those institutional repositories, mapping that content, that content to data site, uh, updating data site. Uh, there's a blog on my website called uh, the Metadata Lifecycle, Metadata Mountain or Superhighway Metadata Mountain refers to the idea that as you climb Metadata Mountain, uh, you drop things uh, by the side of the trail, uh, and those things might be uh, important elements of metadata, so we want to decrease that. Um, also, there's a, a blog on the um, Association of Research Libraries ARL site uh, that describes some of this work in the context of this, of this RADS project. <clears throat> so hopefully those three stories have uh, in interested you and convinced you that it is actually, there are some possibilities for increasing um, uh, fairness in the global research infrastructure. And now the, the final question is how might, how might that apply to EDI? Um, keep in mind here that, that we're talking about the data site repository associated with EDI. Um, which is very different than the the you know the EDI uh, metadata repository that that's that's uh, been you know in existence for many years and and has super content and and very you know it's a, a great example of a of a scientific uh, long term scientific domain repository. Uh, this is the picture from the, the institutional data site repositories that I mentioned before, and the same picture for EDI. Uh, looks like this. Remember that that the uh, example from TIB uh, and also the other institutional repositories shows that this this picture uh, for EDI could be any of the thousands, several thousand, or many of the thousands of repositories that exist at data site. This reflects those things like the uh, getting a DOI from data site and not really thinking of the global infrastructure as something that can hold and benefit from more complete metadata. Um, so EDI is, is uh, in the in the standard uh, in the standard picture here, currently. Um, and then this is the more detailed picture, and this looks again very typical, like the like the TIB picture that I showed. We've got basically um, uh, Mandatory fields. This is the URL, the landing page URL. So it's the it's the only mandatory field that's not in the findable essential. It's it's in the in the access part of air essential. And then we've got a few other things out in these other spirals. But basically, uh, EDI looks very much like um, 
the standard uh, data site or the most, the typical data site picture now. And, and I know just from familiarity with EDI and uh, with EML in general that we, um, you know, there, there, there could be significant uh, gains in completeness in the, in the global infrastructure if, if, we, uh, if we went through the process that we've gone through with those other institutional repositories. So that's the last slide. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions at this point. And um, this work I mentioned uh, was funded by TIB in Germany and also the National Science Foundation. And uh, the data site metadata working group that I, I participate with had a lot of ideas and suggestions for some of these slides. So thanks to them all. Any questions? Thank you, Ted. That was very interesting. And of course, it's very encouraging to for us to keep working. <laughs> yes. So uh -huh. we, we actually have taken a deep dive into trying to spread ORCIDs and around our metadata records. And we will continue to work on that. And we will continue to work with our community on that. And I would like to open the, the floor for questions now. So Marty, you've got a couple here. Do you just want to jump on? Uh, just the one, I think. But oh. um, the, the practice of identifier spreading seems to assume that affiliation stays the same, either through a lifetime or for different purposes. Uh, in LPR, obviously, we have people with uh, multiple affiliations for different purposes. I think of some papers that are associated with a site and some that are not, for instance. So how do you account for that when you do metadata spreading? Um, that's, uh, thanks, Marty, for that question and, and pointing out that that um, that uh, fact. Um, I, I would I would respond first of all saying that for orchids the assumption is justified. Hopefully we only have one orchid uh, and, and it stays with us for all of our all of our life. So for for one of the um, uh, one of the things that we're trying to work with the assumptions are okay. Um, uh, affiliations change and people not only do they change as a function of time people can have multiple affiliations. And in the paper that describes as I talk about this, and, and um, I made the, uh, uh, the the simplifying assumption that if 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 a person has uh, some set of papers and um, and multiple affiliations, I made the assumption that the most common affiliation um, that existed was also the one that should apply to all the other all the papers that don't have affiliations. Um, that assumption is obviously going to be right sometimes, and it's going to be wrong sometimes. So in the process of applying these um, affiliations, you can flag uh, those affiliations that were that where that assumption um, was, you know, came into play. And a data manager who's who's working on the repository can then be aware that you know of the of the ten affiliations for Ted Haberman in this repository, two of them were were unknown before. And was it NOAA or was it the HDF group or was it metadata game changers? We're not sure, but here's here's some that you might want to check. Um, and you know that's. The, the question is, is, is having incorrect affiliations better than having no affiliations? I think that's an interesting question. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that was my, and, and it turned out in, in UNAFCO, that only came into play in um, a very small number of cases, like less than 20 out of whatever we had, 2000 some. Thanks. That obviously would be very different in EDI because most people start as grad students and then start moving around and still submitting data sets. So that would be very different. But I think, right. I think it's, it's there is there, there is some hope of using affiliations in ORCID, which have time ranges to right. try to make that make that better. 
Um, unfortunately, many people get ORCIDs and then they don't share the data. And then even if they share the data, they don't put in their affiliations. So, right. so in, yeah. in a perfect world, ORCID could help us with that, but it's not, we're sort of still far from that perfect world. Hi, first of all, thank you, Ted, that was a, that's no problem. Um, Ted, that was uh, really fantastic. I, uh, it's, it's brought together a lot of things I've been thinking about, not brought together, it's, it's educated me about a lot of things I've been thinking about, but um, I just so absolutely, uh, you know, stunning. So I, I was taken by one of your phrases, I really liked it, where you said, we wanna get, I think this is a quote, Get DOIs out. Get DOIs out into the the global stream. So I really like that that concept. So I am involved with uh, with getting DOIs into tools other than repositories. And I what I kind of envision this global stream. If I think of the research lifecycle, you've got a flow of data at one level, and then you've got a flow of of, of metadata at another level, of which DOIs are or a kind of a founding principle. Um, so my question is, is a bit challenging. I, I think everything understandably for the last 15 years or so has been very repository centric. You're kind of waiting to get everything into a repository and that's the magic endpoint. I tend to view it as a much more, I think we should move beyond that to a much more dynamic situation where, where it's an ongoing cycle. And I think that fits in quite well with your, your global stream. You're clearly someone who's thought more than just about anybody else, or not just thought, but been involved with DOIs in a, in a dynamic sense. Your three examples were all, all repositories, again, understandably, but to what extent do you think um, the community, the world, et cetera, is, is ready to, to move to a kind of post-repository centric view of a more dynamic, a more dynamic stream uh, and and are you interested in that concept, or are you are you going to continue your own focus on repositories? Uh, first of all, I'm definitely interested in that concept. Okay, let's just establish that as a as a baseline. Um, and I, I think that I think that you know the key the word that you said that really resonates with me is that dynamic word, because we the the research you know the research community is incredibly dynamic, and and I think that that. Um, you know, even in a post-repository world, we're still going to have repositories. We're still going to have journals, um, and you know, doing simple things like trying to get identifiers into those is sort of what I'm focused on at this point. You know, journals and, and many people. You know, uh, Shelley from AGU spoke with you guys a little while ago, and and you know, AGU and other per people like Kirsten uh, Leonard and, and many others. You know the importance of journals in this game is still um, they're still important, and they they don't they you know they're only now starting to collect more than one orchid, uh, even if a paper has you know fifteen authors, um, and so getting these identifiers out so that you can do these dynamic things, um, I think is is important, and I I'd love to hear more. You know, you've got my email. I'd love to hear more about your concept or your picture of the more dynamic um, world here, because I think I think that's super interesting. Great, I, I'll I'll reach out. Absolutely, we should talk. But I think if a, D, a DNP tool is is like a, a good case in point, as you as you as you know, I know since you've left, but in the last couple of years, they've been heavily focused on on trying to incorporate. I think they have like seven different kinds of of DOIs, which they're now enabling association with DMP tool. And then DMP tool, it, to me, that's another core tool along with repositories. But again, there are others. And how do you, how do you, how do you enable the, the passage of these DOIs between the different tools? That's a, there's, there's a set of challenges there as well. Right. Um, so yeah, anyway, so great, I'll, I'll reach out to you. Yeah. Um, I am happy to say, Roy, that if you look at metadatagamechangers.com, there's a blog post there about DOIs and connecting DOIs with output management plans or data management plans because we we are trying to they're, uh, they're a new thing in data site and we're interested in standardizing the way that those connections are made so that we can we can uh, you know process and understand them.
to uh, Terry, and and I'm just writing something now about using um, using data site for project identifiers, which I think is another, you know, we we need a way to connect things to projects, and um, and data management tools are in that in that game. But I I think that just having a clean project identifier might be might be better. Okay, great, thank you. Any last question here? I obviously have a number, but I think we should respect everybody's time here. So thank you so much, Ted. That was a very interesting presentation. And I hope you did inspire us and everyone for finding all those ORCIDs for their customers and all of the ROARs for their affiliations and actually enter them. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Karina. I was, and uh, I was happy to have this opportunity. And you know, everyone knows my email is not that hard to find. So if you have questions, let me know. <laughs>